Good morning. Thank you for joining us at Pine Grove Missionary Baptist Church of Linside, West Virginia. May you be blessed as well as challenged in the word of truth today. The name of the title is Walking in Newness of Life. Walking in Newness of Life. You know, there's only two possible kinds of people here or listening. One is a born-again believer, one who has received Christ, or someone who has not received Christ and is lost. That's the only kind of people that there are. You know, they're referred to as the people call them, either you're saved or you're lost. The believer received eternal life and will not come into condemnation. And condemnation means judgment, judgment from God for sin. Amen. John chapter 5 and verse 24 reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. There's that word condemnation, which means God's judgment once again, but is passed from death unto life. Man is made righteous through Christ and only through Christ. There's no righteousness in us, but we can have that through Christ. And the Bible tells us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, we're talking about Jesus, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the only way righteousness can be imputed on us is through Jesus Christ. As a child of God, we have a new identity, a position in Christ, a new purpose for living. Living for Christ and not self. That's the problem we have trouble with, amen? There are many professing Christians that may be saved, but their lifestyle, their priorities, their testimony does not match their claims of being a child of God. It's easy to claim anything, but do you live up to it? The old adage says, you talk the walk, but do you not walk the talk. How many ever has ever heard that old adage? You know, that's an old one. People are claiming Christianity, but they're not living it. You know, we can be here and be churchy this morning, but are we churchy when we go out the doors, go out into the lost and dying world? Are we living the life that we're supposed to for our Lord and Savior? That's where this is going today. If the world around uh, doesn't see any righteousness and no godliness and no behavior, it's, we're being hypocritical in our testimony. Amen? You know, uh, it's easy to make, we all make mistakes, we all sin, we sin even after we're saved, we're sinners saved by grace, amen? You know, and that's when anybody around you, when you stumble, you fall, you say something you shouldn't, they cue in on that just like that, don't they? They expect us to be perfect. If you would, turn to your Bible to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, begin with verse 1. We'll take a look at a few scriptures here. Romans chapter 6, begin with verse 1. As a believer, you need to know your position in Christ. As a believer, you need to live your position in Christ. There are many, as I said, many professing Christians, maybe you're one of them, uh, that's not living your life for your Lord Jesus. You're not really living it. You're not really walking close with him. You're not really, it's not your main thing. Many go to church on Sunday, and, but they live like a devil the rest of the week. That's sad, but it's so true. Most Christians are very churchy on Sunday, but they're worldly the rest of the week. The church in, in, in majority, uh, the world can't tell the church any different from the world. And that's sad. That's why our country is in the mess that it's in. We often give the world our very best, and then we want to give God the rest. We want to give him the leftovers. We do that in our lifestyle. We get up and we go to work. We go do our thing with pleasure. We entertain ourselves. We do all these things, and I need to pray. I need to study. I need to, I need to go to, uh, witness to people, and I'll get right on that after I do all these other things. I'm going to do that. I'm going to start a better study habit. I'm going to have a better prayer life. 
and then you wait till your eyes is heavy and you can't hardly hold your head up and you realize, oh, I was supposed to study tonight. I was supposed to uh, have a better prayer life. And you can't even concentrate. You're wore out. You give the world and everything and everybody but God your best energy, your best effort. And then there's God. I can't even, I fall asleep in the process of praying or trying to read or study. That is not right. God isn't going to play second fiddle, amen? We're putting things before God, and it's wrong, it's sin. When we realize our position and where we're at in the family of God, our, our habits should be turned that way. Let's look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Question. Our position in Christ does not warrant for us to sin. We're, we're not saved and then given a card saying, oh, just sin all you want to. You've heard that old saying, oh, yeah, we know how you are out that church. You're saved, so you can just go sin and do whatever you want to. No, that ain't the way it is, amen. Yes, we're living under grace, but we don't have a, a sin-free card, or do we? We do not. We're not to continue in sin. God forbid, verse 2 says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The scripture text, the main point of this message this morning is coming from uh, Romans 6, 4, and I'm going to read it again. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's what we need to think about this morning. As a believer, we are positionally in Christ because of the finished work that he completed. We were uh, buried with him. We were resurrected with him. And uh, because of our new life, we received new life. We received eternal life. The change within, the change within ownership, we belong to Christ. We were bought with a high price, the blood shed of Jesus Christ, amen. We don't belong to ourselves, we belong to him. The last part of that verse says, so we also should do what? Walk. Walk in what? In newness of life. We're not the same person. We're not going to be the same person. When we get saved and Christ comes in, you can't be the same person. There will be and must be a change in you, within you, and your lifestyle. If you're here, you're a child of God, you should honestly be able to say and testify, well, I may not be what I should be, but I ain't what I was when I first got saved. I ain't like I used to be last year. I ain't like I used to be six months ago. You should continually be growing and, and growing in the knowledge uh, and relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. You shouldn't be the same as you once was. The old man was put down. Sin was put down. A new man was born unto righteousness. There has to be a difference. There has to be a difference. We should have a different appetite. We should have a different desire. Our priorities should be different. I remember giving a testimony of this, and it's true. I remember after I got saved, some short period of time went by, and you'd go talk to some of the deacons, the people in my former church, and I told them, my walk to is not what it used to be. I, I don't want to do those things anymore. I don't want to participate in those things I used to do and I think was great. My lifestyle wasn't pretty. There was a lot of nasty in it, a lot of nasty language, a lot of nasty thought, a lot of nasty actions going on. And once Jesus come in, I told him, I said, I don't want to do that no more. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't like being out in public and hearing the Lord's name used in vain. I don't want to hear cussing and swarping. I don't want to hear fighting. I don't want to hear and see killing. I'm not into that because I'm different. The difference is Christ moved in. 
and Jay has to move out. A key word in that verse also is to walk. Walk means as you travel, as you move, as you go forward. Normally when we walk, we walk forward, don't we? We don't walk backward. We can, and then we'll fall. But we walk forward and going through life. We walk down life's pathway. We walk in newness of life. From the time you're saved, you walk in newness of life, and your life and your focus should have changed. What is newness of life? You say, well, what are you talking about? Drop down to verse 11. Same chapter, Romans 6. Let's drop down to verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. You know, we must fight against sin and the practice of it. Don't give in to the lust of the body, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. We constantly struggle. We're constantly at war with the old man, aren't we? Satan wants us to do the old things. He wants you to go back. And, have you ever noticed how Satan will bring up your past, something five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, dumb stuff that you've done and bring it back and bring it to your attention to try to make you feel like you've lost and that you're a loser and that there's no godliness in you? Why? He wants you to go back to the flesh. The old flesh, we fight against it day in and day out. It don't matter how long you've been saved, we're always trying to pick up the old man, that old nature. But we don't have to. We don't have to. It has no power over us. It has no power over us. Our sin nature desires for us to be obedient to this old flesh. Look at verse 13. It says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't be part of it. Don't be part of sin. It says, But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of what? Righteousness unto God. We choose every day. We choose every moment of what we're going to think, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. Yes, there's a lot of things that we have to do. We have not a whole lot of choice about. There's a lot of circumstances that comes up in our life that we don't choose. We don't drum them up, but there they are. How we react to them is up to us. Amen? We can react in a righteous way or we can act in a fleshly way. Yield to righteousness. Yield to God. We struggle to be obedient to God. When we sin and we're going to, confess it. Immediately. Don't wait. When you say something, you think something, you do something wrong, you know that you messed up. You know it wasn't right. You're convicted if you're a child of God. You feel conviction. You're like, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have looked like that. I shouldn't have went there. Then when you realize it and you, you feel guilt, you feel conviction, you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I should I knew better. I knew better. You, you don't have to say I should have knew better. You knew better. If you feel conviction, you feel uh, guilt, then you knew better. And ask forgiveness and own up to it and confess up to it. You know, David was the first one. David, was uh, he messed up, but he was a, very quick to own up to it and ask forgiveness, didn't he? We should have an appetite. Our appetite should have changed. Before I got saved, I wasn't interested in going to church. That would be the last place I would want to go. Why would I want to go to church before I got saved? I had nothing in common. I don't know nothing about them people. I'm not interested. But as a child of God, I have a desire to be in the house of God. Amen. I got an appetite for the things of God. We should have an appetite to get in the Word of God. We should have an appetite to draw closer to our Savior. We should have an appetite for righteousness. We should have an appetite for it because we belong to Him. 
We should want to study. We should want to have a prayer life. We should want to share the gospel. If God is good and we say he is, and he surely is, and if he belongs to you, if you belong to him, then why are you not wanting to share it with somebody? Why are we not testifying? Why are we not trying to win others to the Lord? Why are we not telling other people what God has done in your life? Has he done anything in your life? Look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Sin doesn't have dominion over you. We pick it up. We opt to take it. Sin has no dominion. Verse 15 says, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Just because we're under God's grace doesn't mean that we shouldn't take sin seriously. Amen? It, shouldn't be, it should be our very desire to never sin. Now, are we going to make that mark? No, we're going to sin. We're sinners saved by grace. Yes, we are. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to sin, even though we're saved. But when we do, we need to ask forgiveness. We need to turn from that. We need to try not to entertain it. You know, we entertain sin, don't we? If you got stumbling blocks, that's like somebody that, that likes alcohol. Well, don't go to a bar. Don't go around people drinking. Don't go to the beer section. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Don't entertain it. If you have trouble dealing with the uh, lust of the flesh and pornography and, and sexual behavior, don't go to the beach. Don't go to places. Don't go to places where it's going to entice you to think and to do the wrong thing. Stay away from it. Don't put yourself in the firing line. Turn away from that old fleshly desires. Stay away from it. Stay away from people that is leading you to go the wrong way. The believer is to live a holy life, become a servant of righteousness. Listen to that again. Let me read that again. The believer is to live a holy life and become a servant of righteousness. We're to be about his business. We should have the same burden for the lost as Jesus Christ. We should have compassion and forgiveness for those around us. A genuinely saved person cannot abuse the mercy of God. What's that mean? Well, I'm saved, so I'll go out here and just do anything I want to because God's going to forgive me. No, that's, you're abusing grace. You're stepping out of bounds. You cannot walk in sin. You cannot make a habit of sinning. To do so, you're treading upon the mercy of God and you're making a mockery of God's forgiveness and his grace. Because other people's going to see you doing that. And that's making a mockery of God. It's making a mockery of who, his righteousness. It's wrong. And they were turning people away. It's wrong. We're spitting in God's face and his righteousness. We don't practice the Christian life taught by the Bible. We live it. That's what we need to do. We need to live it. There's one thing about knowing about it, but living it is completely different, isn't it? That's when it gets hard. You know, a lot of people, they think once you get saved, it's going to be utopia in your life. Never going to be no problems. Everything's going to be perfect. You ain't going to have any issues. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be rich. You're going to be healthy. Everything's going to be great. That's a devil's lie, isn't it? That's a devil's lie. Talking about being saved and living it is another. Too many speak about being religious. Ain't that a very popular word? Yeah, I'm religious. Well, a drunkard's religious to drink beer, too. You can religiously do anything. You can religiously get up every morning and drink a cup of coffee. When you do something repetitively, we, it's religious. I go to church religiously. Well, you should, but you should live the word of God when you, when you leave church. Amen? Too many people are speaking about being religious, but they're not righteous. There's a difference between being religious and being righteous. Many people, even here, each one of us needs to get serious with God. We need to get serious with God right now. What we've done yesterday, we cannot go back and change it, folks. 
We can't change the past. We can't do anything about what's happened last year, last month. Ten years ago. Yeah, there's all kinds of dreadful things this old boy's done I wished I hadn't have done. Things I wished I'd have never said. Places I should have never went. Things I should have never done. But you know what? I can't do anything with that. But starting right now, I can be serious to live my life for the glory of God, my Savior. Realizing my position in Christ. And I'm to live it the best I can. Let me ask you, if people follow you around, if your co-worker sees you, your neighbor sees you, people sees you out in the public, what do they see in you? Do they see a righteous person? Do they see a person that's committed to God? Or do they see somebody that's been talking it but you're not walking it? You know, when church service is going on, when your church, this fish is your church, and this church has got a, something going on, you're supposed to be a part of it, a member of it, you're supposed to support it. And when something's going on here and you're out somewhere else and people knows it and your community and sees it, says, well, why ain't they at church? Why are they not at church on Sunday night? Why are they not at church on Wednesday? I thought they were Christians. I thought they was a member of that church out there. What's, is that not hypocritical to what we say we are? Listen, I'm not throwing rocks. I'm being serious. People is watching you and I every move that we make. Every move that we make. And they're looking. And you know what? There's people needing answers. There's people needing a Savior around us. And who's going to tell them? Who's going to show them? Have you ever had anybody tell you you're the real deal? I've been watching you and you're the real deal. That's a compliment. Praise and glory be to God if you've been told that. Because they've been watching you. I can't remember what evangelist was. Uh, I can't remember but the story was awesome. He talked about the neighbor that was rough and he had, he had chastised and, and had nothing to do with any pastor and never come to that church. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. He said, I hope that man just let him see Christ in me and not me. And over a period of time, that rebellious, hardened-hearted, stiff guy in the neighborhood around that church come to him and says, you're the real deal. And he got saved. Listen. We are around the people that God has put us around daily to be a light in a dark place. That we should be different. We should act different. We should respond different. And I'm telling you, it's tough sometimes, ain't it? It's tough. It's tough on some jobs. It's tough in some circumstances. It's tough. Because Satan's doing everything he can to trip you up. Doing everything he can to rub you wrong trying to do anything he can, bring up your past, bring up things that you can't stand to deal with because he wants to ruin your testimony. He wants people not to see your position in Christ. He wants to discredit that. This morning, let me ask you, are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you ever invited him into your heart? You can this morning. You can leave here and be positioned with Christ, in Christ. Maybe you're here and God is speaking to your heart. You haven't been living up to God's standards. You haven't been living the life that you claim to be. If that's you, would you like to rededicate your life this morning as the pianist comes? Let me ask you, if you're not saved, the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all sin to come short of the glory of God. You realize that we're all sinners and you're a sinner. That includes you. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages or penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because of your sin, you're spiritually dead. You're separated from God, but through Jesus Christ, you can have eternal life. You know, long before we were ever here, God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5, 8. Because he loves us. He loves you 
exactly just for you. He looks past your sin. He looks past all those things that you've done wrong. And he sees somebody that he created and he loves so dear that he gave his son to die on the cross of Calvary. He's looked past that sin. He knows you've got sin, but he wants to redeem you. He wants to save you this morning. Romans 